Hi there. So this is episode number three of the live stream and the red special is still not here. So, um, well, maybe next episode I can show you the Vox AC30 and the Brian May guitar, so to speak. Um, I thought I talk a bit more about strats in this episode. I'm a guy that plays tons of strats for all my life. And I looked at all the details for what makes a strat great or what is the stuff that I like on strats and what is what makes my strat sound the way um, it should sound. So the whole thing started with my, let's, let's put it that way, it whole thing started with a shitty strat. When I was a teenager, my first Fender strat was kind of the worst thing ever, you know, very thick um, lacquering, very thick paint, one of those 80s, heavy like shit, and three bolt um, neck joint. Well, maybe three bolt, you know, all of the individual um, things were not the killer, but uh, combined of all this, was this was not a great guitar. I had issues to, to have it in tune, so I had sometimes <laughs> to knock it on my knee and move the neck upwards, stuff like that. Unbelievable. Anyway, so this was the lowest level I could start with a Strat. And then I thought, man, I need a better guitar. So I asked a guitar luthier back then, and he told me, yeah, you probably get one of those Squire, the first GB uh, Japan series Squires. And they were kind of vintage spec with nitrocellulosis lacquer, with vintage kind of uh, feel from the neck with the four screws on the neck joint. And okay, that's what's a kind of bit better. And of course, I was curious how to even improve that one. So I started to experiment with pickups. Um, I kind of swapped different pickups in the guitar and then I came up uh, with my uh, hum cancelling coil idea, you know, I, I'm playing. I'm playing gain tones as well as clean tones, but if you have um, a single coil, you have hum. So the thing was the dummy coil. Okay. Um, in the last episode, I actually talked a bit about the tonal effect of the dummy coil. Um, in the meantime, I put together this scratch blade for an, a guitar. And here you can see the wiring. Maybe I put this guitar aside and hold it underneath here so you can look at the detail. You can see the three pickups. And this is an extra pickup, which is now the dummy coil. And that's the five-way switch that I'm using. And as you can see, the five-way switch has like two sides. I use the one side to switch the input from the pickups. And I use the, the other side to make the bypass of the dummy coil when I use the middle pickup. <laughs> because this thing is kind of combining two things that I found out. The reverse wound middle pickup cancels the hum in the in-between positions. So the extra dummy coil adds reversed in phase the hum, so it reduces the hum on the outer pickups. And it actually doubles the hum for the middle pickup because this is reverse wound. Anyway, I use the second side here to make this automatic bypass and it simply works. Um, yeah, and this is the way how it fits inside the guitar as well. So I, I've kind of put it here, maybe tape it and that uh, fits in a standard Stratocaster. So that's the scratch blade. Besides the scratch blade, I found out other stuff like there is springs the springs that hold the tremolo system that give you tension. And when you bend the strings, you can feel harder or softer tension. 
I found out this also affects the tone. So mm -hmm, I started to experiment with springs. I like them not too soft. Um, next thing I found is the tremolo system. And the tremolo system consists out of a few parts. Okay, there's like the base plate uh, where the saddles are mounted to and then there's the big block here and the strings go from this side through the block then they come to a saddle like this and yeah, the saddle would go in here and then you see the string would go through that hole on top of the saddle and then uh, onwards to the, uh, the fretboard. The point is, you wouldn't believe that all these materials affect the tone. Um, there are lightweight blocks which sound thin, I would say. I found that the old cold rolled steel blocks is what I like the best for, well, a thick, stable 50s tone. And actually the 50s strats had the heaviest blocks that I found. And they got lighter and lighter, maybe cheaper and cheaper, but that, that's the blocks that I like, cold rolled steel. The next thing is this base plate here. The harder the base plate, the more defined the tone as well. And then you got the saddles. There is the, the material for the saddle itself, this kind of bent iron, so to speak. And there's the screws and every detail affects the tone. And I was experimenting with how can I get a tone that is as good as my real 61 strat, which is behind me and I will play that. And I found, well, the only strat that sounds like that strat is that strat. No other guitar sounds the same. And I tried very hard to copy my own number one guitar with any components, with real Fender components. I <laughs> bought a real 1960 neck and I was having different bodies for it and all that stuff. And not everybody matches the neck. The neck is great. I knew that because it was hard and stiff. Um, but I had like three or four bodies connected to that neck and the guitar didn't sound right. And then one day I found the right body. I, unfortunately or luckily it wasn't even a, a vintage Fender body. It was a body that was laying around at my friend's place, Andreas Glockmann, and uh, it simply matched that guitar. Um, let me show you tonal differences, okay? Um, so this was the blue guitar. I start now with the real deal, with the... Where is it? There is the 61. So... And of course, it's my best guitar, since I spent most time with it, and I spent most time modifying it. This is the tone I had in my head, you know, of course it's the guitar and the amp, but basically this is kind of a cranked Plexi Marshall um, tone with that guitar, that's my tone. And now look or listen for all the details. I have tons of treble here and this is why I like that treble bleed capacitor that I showed you in the last episode. Um, 
if you think this is too much, it's a matter of taste. It's not what I like is the best, it's just what I like is the best for me, for what I do. So that's the one thing. But the other thing is when I crank the guitar, yeah, you can hear blah, it got balls. Okay, let's go back and play it cleaner. So. So this is what this guitar sounds with the three pickups and with no hum cancelling coil engaged. If I use my setup with the hum cancelling coil, I use a little bit of the high end, but... That's the difference. Anyway, um, this would be this guitar. And now I show you a real 1960 Fender neck, a real 60s tremolo Fender in another guitar. And you will hear a great guitar, but it's a different tone. So it took me 10 years to get that guitar going. Hmm, are you disappointed? <laughs> well, that's a great guitar. If you have the AB comparison, you can tell the other one is still uh, has a magic. But... but as I told you, this took me, I think, 10 years to get this guitar at this level. And I'm, see, this is the real deal um, tremolo system. This is the real Fender neck and it's solid stuff. Um, but I learned, even if this, the logo Fender is on it, and if I have the best components, it doesn't mean that I get the same guitar or the same quality. So I was starting to think about, man, how do I get there? So I have to use the individual parameters to tune a guitar to the way that it sounds in that direction where I want to go. Okay. And here is my vintage signature guitar, which is a totally different price range, of course. It's an affordable guitar, 500 euros or whatever. And well, I can do my thing. It's maybe not as defined as the real deal old guitars, but
Yeah, so what can we learn? This is a guitar and I can do my thing with it. And after a while, I even forget about if I play the real deal guitar or if I play this guitar. Um, why does this work? Well, I understood the recipe of my guitar and I used all my knowledge in detail to tune this guitar at that price point to my tone. So, you know, I've got my treble bleed capacitor, I got my dummy coil and I got pickups that have this kind of um, clarity and not being too overwound and, and stuff. Even with um, a tremolo block that is not cold rolled steel. Um, but it has great saddles. <laughs> I've done a, um, a comparison about all the saddles, which was real old Fender saddles. Um, what is the other thing? What is this? This is a um, raw vintage, you know, that's another boutique thing you can buy. Then um, we, had, oh, we have these vintage saddles from this guitar and they are actually the best. And we do have, besides the, the original Fender saddles, and this is titanium, it's another great thing. Um, so, what's the lesson? The lesson is simply, if you know your tone, you can decide if you go for titanium, if you go and mod for raw vintage, if you go and leave the original ones, or have different pickups and stuff. I know it's a lot, and it's many parameters, but I spent my whole life doing that on Stratocasters. And I wanted to share that knowledge with me. Another thing I want to tell you about strats is um, the height of the tremolo affects the tone a lot. So um, I have it free floating. So. Um, of course, when the, when the tremolo is free, um, you have to be a bit careful with how much pressure you apply, otherwise it's like... Okay, so a, a lighter touch does help here. <laughs> If you have the plate touching the wood, um, two things. If you use it as a vibrato, it will not go higher. It will just go lower and stay there. And it even, I found, has more tuning issues after, uh, when you do that that way. So you, you shouldn't use the Vemi bar at all. The thing here is um, you have to decide how you set it up. And the next thing is um, use it in a way that the saddles are not too high. Or let's put it that way. The height of the saddles affects the tone as well. The lower, maybe the better. The higher, the spankier. Anyway, that's, that's another thing. And while talking about this little fellow here, the whammy bar, on the vintage it's simply inject, done. Um, on the blue guitar or on the fenders, you do have a whammy bar. Do we have a whammy bar? No. Um, that is kind of in here. And here's a little trick tip that I've done to all my whammy bars. Um, I use Teflon tape. Teflon tape is what you use for water pipes to make them tight and not leaking. It's this kind of stuff here. And this little tape goes around your whammy bar and then it does two things. It kind of protects metal touching metal, which is great because um, if you don't do that, if you use it intensely, like Richie Blackmore, one day it might fall apart. And uh, the other thing is, this also gives you a better feel because it's, it's, 
it's not like loose, 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 loose and makes the wobbly, wobbly, wobbly noise. It, it's kind of tight and um, it is, yeah, it stays in here and, you know, it it's, has a good feel to it. So um, maybe you have to replace it every year, but that's not a big deal. So. <laughs> Anyway, with this guitar, I put all my knowledge and the knowledge of my friends Trevor Wilkinson from the Vintage and Andreas Klopmann to this one particular guitar and um, yeah, it does my thing now. Anyway, and if I go back for the original still, I tell you there is a touch magic which I don't have in this guitar. And maybe it's just because I play the other one for 4,000 gigs, <laughs> so you never know. Yeah, um, if you do have any questions on Stratocasters, we probably can answer some now. And then I have another topic about M1 and boosters and fuzzes and uh, muffs. Okay, Eric writes, hello Thomas, can you use half power and low gain mode at the same time? Yes, you can. Um, last time we talked about M1 and the what we call it the power-up functions. So the three internal foot switches hold special functions. Amp 1 is a 100 watt nanotube amp, but if you want to reduce it to 50 watt, you simply switch it off, press and hold this first button, and while switching on and holding it down, switch it on, and then the amp has only 50 watts. And um, you can do a similar thing with the boost button and that engages the low gain mode. Low gain is great if you want to have less sparkle. I, I like the high gain as you can hear. I like the, 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 the shimmering highs and the tap, the gain on tap for my volume control. But other people want the woodier, more authentic vintage tone and um, therefore we have the low gain mode and this is under so to uh, under the boost button press and hold the boost button while switching it on it's only a small difference you can even fine tune that we have our expert modes uh, on the website where we describe where you can kind of tune every channel of the amp one with individual gain and that does a lot. It's like modding your amplifier. It's like you have a high input and you have a low input on vintage amps and you can kind of go in between or any kind of setting. Um, so this makes the amp one a lot more versatile than you think at first glance. Um, I like it the way it is and the way we ship it. This is why, why we have this as a default setting. But I know there are other people with other guitars and other tones in their heads and so we offer this. And yes, you can use both at the same time. Ron, I play a Strat with Texas Specials. I get an okay sound of, out of it, but the tone seems to, to die very soon. Okay, no sustain as you always seem to get with the vintage channel. What's the secret? Hmm. Um, I don't know your guitar. That's the, the first point. Um, Two things you can do. Of course, the guitar offers you the sustain that the guitar offers. And um, one thing is um, look if there's anything on the guitar that can be improved so that, that, that the string um, is dying. 
um, sometimes you have little things here that you know some dust or something that blocks it mm, sometimes guitars are weird so I don't know your guitar maybe the guitar is totally okay maybe not um, but if you find anything when you play it without amplification and the, the tone kind of dies okay you don't hear it I, I, this rings still that's a great guitar why well expensive woods and you know good materials and you know we've done everything to get sustain out of the guitar um, having the cold rolled steel block etc my trick is I use my pinky on my little finger on the volume control and when I hear the note is dying without you noticing I can still get more volume with the pinky I show you so it's my okay so it's like my built-in compressor here and I use that um, yeah if I want to have one of those notes sometimes I hit a note very hard but not on 10 and then I use that effect to kind of make a longer note compared to see. so there's still some gain on tap if you do my trick here That's what I do. Yeah, but that's that's what I I can. That, that's my secret. That's my secret. Maybe it helps. Okay, Bernd Hackel. Uh, wann gibt es die 61? Well, the 61. This guitar is handmade, and there's a long waiting list. If if you want to go and get one of those, write us an email. We will get eventually a few. And maybe if you're lucky, you get one. Let's see what we can do. But that's all I can offer at this point. Ben Grenfeld, hello, my dear colleague from Finland. Uh, I made, he made it this time. Yeah, what's your opinion on titanium bridge saddles? Yes, for instance, I broke more strings uh, with the original Fender saddles than with the titanium ones. Tonal differences, yes, but not better or worse, just different. Um, yeah. Okay, it's, my answer is yes, there are tonal differences and yes, saddles can... Um, when I checked these out, the titanium ones, I thought, yeah, they have more O. You know, I'm a guy that likes to have the O here, even in my bridge pickup, like... <laughs> the O, 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 you know, usually if you have a ah, 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 uh, kind of pickup on the bridge, this is offensive tones. I don't like that. I like, you know, nice and round, but still twangy O. That's the O. Okay, and the titanium saddle seems to boost the O a bit. That's what I liked about it. But then I found out there's a benefit and I was losing some something that I didn't like. So I played those for a few years and then I found some other combination that <laughs> is going back to the original whatever metal material um, iron whatever that is and um, yeah compensate my O some, somewhere else uh, got it from here um, the thing about breaking strings yeah you're right um, the biggest change for me was changing my strings in the old days, I played um, uh, Ernie Ball Hybrid Slinkies. I still play Ernie Ball Hybrid Slinkies, but now they have a new set that is called Reinforced Plain Strings. And I guess they designed these kind of strings because 
the other ones were so lousy they broke like I you know I had to put on fresh strings for all the important gigs and man you know how that is having new strings it they never stay in tune the first three songs so and now Ernie Ball improved their quality um, and that was the biggest change but I found um, the edges on the saddle they are critical and they should be round and maybe you can see it on some of the other saddles ah maybe this one um, uh, it's hard to see wait a minute uh, do I see it um, some of the fender saddles they do have um, a little groove in the middle um, kind of to, to fix the strings in the middle of the saddle and when the groove has an edge here and when the, the angle of the string is too sharp the string kind of gets to a point where it's easy to break it so that's one thing so sometimes I, I use a little file and make that softer that helps yeah anyway guys check out Ben Grenfeld he is a killer guitar player and we did um, yeah last year in fall we did a nice tour of I think 10 gigs and um, he played with Wishbone Ash and he has great solo records out um, and he's Mr. Melodic Guitar um, he plays so tasteful and when we play together I feel like oh I can play with a guitar player together it's not like I kill you you kill me or we, we try to be uh, better than the other one no we are we are more like brothers fight just a little bit and the rest is nice harmony and this is what what we've done with uh, two-part harmonies on the guitar it's it's a, a great thing um, yeah we hopefully do that again after the corona crisis um, next question Peter Coldwell what that Mike Smith who made your blue guitar at Wilkinson ah, was it Mike yeah um, Mike used to make these yeah the problem is um, he helped Trev and probably he has to seen too many of those white guitars so he quit um, all I can say he's a great guy and he made great guitars and uh, yeah um, I wish he would do more <laughs> um, unfortunately uh, yeah we we have we have a new way how to to do it um, which is Andreas Klopman now took over and um, Trevor kind of helps still in Trevor Wilkinson helps us okay next hi Thomas I'm a blue box user and would like to ask you about using them as part of a stereo rig if I want to experiment with uh, blending cap settings will I run into face issues actually no here's the thing um, blue box this little fellow here is an IR based speaker emulator and as I've done all the IRs myself and as I have some studio experience <laughs> I recorded all my albums and I played on I don't know how many 50 60 other uh, albums here in Germany and some from UK artists even and uh, very little for some uh, American uh, artist I have some studio experience and I know that face is a critical thing and if you have a blue box and if you have another blue box on the same output if the outputs are in phase um, so the signal that goes to the to the blue box is in phase the output of the blue box will also be in phase I paid a lot of attention to make that um, happening so you don't have to worry simply plug play have as many tracks as you like so the blue box will be in phase with each other if you have other um, sources like microphones of course then you have to check phase again because uh, depends on the distance to the membrane uh, and um, yeah a, a simple thing to do is uh, <coughs> 
you just make a, a, a click noise like this and then if that click noise you can see a spike kind of on all the tracks and then if you zoom in all your tracks you try to make them in line um, zoom as 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 hard as you can and then if they are all in line they are in phase but I used two blue boxes on the um, Rock Anarchy live uh, CD and DVD. You know, I, I, I didn't know, um, um, uh, you know, mics, everything. You know, we, we, we played a, a nice club and, you know, a live show is a live show. You go on stage and you kill it uh, and that's it. So I, I decided, you know what, I use simply two different sounds of the blue box and that's my tone on that live and CD and DVD and sounds good. I'm happy with that. And this is what I'm using right now as well. This is, it's, it's down there. That's the blue box. Okay. Patrick has, hi Tom, Tom hey? <laughs> Thomas, uh, whatever. Um, do you use floating tremolo? Yes, with drop detuning. Or do you have different guitars when necessary? Or do you use different strings as heavier button ones? Okay, I start with the end. Yes, I do play um, 9 to 46 hybrid slinkies. So this is 9th, which is the, 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 um, the little E string, the B string and the G string. And um, the low E string is 10 from a 10 set. It's 46, 36 and 26. Um, for the reason is if I if I'm a rock guitar player I dig in hard and I have a very hard pick so I sometimes I need to have uh, a lot of energy and then if you have thinner strings the thinner strings tend to go sharp and go out of tune so therefore I have the heavy bottom strings and lighter top strings makes it easier to bend so in the old days, I had always issues with my fingertips uh, and, um, you know... Okay, wow, the reverb is nice. Um, so what I do, I simply detune the low E string, but I have to have a tuner because floating bridge, as you mentioned, uh, makes the rest of the guitar going sharp if I go to the low D. So that's why I do it very, very rarely. Um, if I had a set where I need to do it, I have a separate guitar and have that tuned with the drop D uh, and then I grab that guitar. That's the way I, I've done it. But I try to avoid it. Um, but of course it depends on your music um, if you need that drop D. Okay, next question. I try to... Who needs a tuner if you got ears? <laughs> okay, next question. Roger Stuckey, um, do you have any tips to improve tuning stability on strats? Yeah, thanks, very cool, for interesting stream. Okay, um, you can see one of the first things I've done to all my guitars is I lift the string tree. Maybe you can see the string is now uh, 
higher than the the string tree here and it's you know it's not much so I try you know to lift that that thing that holds the strings down to the minimum of angle I need so the string can still vibrate safely but without going like this because if if the angle is too tight um, uh, if it's too steep um, every time when I bend the string the string will kind of cut into the nut and then you know you do a lot of bending and like half a year later um, the string gets st stuck inside your nut so that's the second point the second point is your nut needs to be cleaned and like once a year I, I simply get the strings out of it and then um, use some sandpaper like you know thousands I don't know if this that uh, does it in, uh, and then I kind of recut it and if it's too deep I have um, if I went too far, um, I have a, su a super simple trick. I use super glue and put just one drop in, in there. And then if it's a bone nut, I can use the sandpaper and get some rub it here. And then I get a little bit more of that um, um, stuff in, in the nut here. And that's, yeah, fills it up. And then the string is higher again and when it's higher again and it's still not if it's too high then I cut it again so that's the way how to to make this work the next thing here is um, on the bridge we do have basically six screws yeah but I'm <laughs> the guy with the five screws um, and the reason for that is on my original 61 Strat, I um, had an issue with tuning. And I simply was experimenting and found out that my third screw was causing the problem. And then I got rid of the screw. And back in the days, you know, nobody did care about is this guitar original or it's just an old Strat and who cares. So I got rid of the screw and, um, you know, the. The real nerds, they, they told this guy is the guy with the five screws only. So um, now it's my trademark. But the, the, the point is, if there is some friction on the screws, um, try to loosen them, have the outer screws guide the, um, the plate. So how to do that? get the strings off, get the, the springs off, so you can feel how the tremolo system moves. And then you go and have this, the outer screws um, see where, where, where they kind of grab um, the plate. And then just loosen them a tiny little bit, just a, whatever, a touch of a winding, and that's it. And the inner screws, they don't need to touch the, the plate. They are just there to guide it, uh, so they can be higher. That's the thing here on what I'm doing um, with the screws. On, on the back um, with the springs, I'm not sure if that's um, my own philosophy, if it really does help, but I thought if I have um, the thicker bottom strings, you know, uh, 9 to 46, I thought maybe, I don't know if it's true, there's more tension on the lower strings. So I angle this um, spring and there is more tension from the spring to compensate um, the thicker bottom strings. So that's my belief. I don't know if it's true. I just do it like that and it seems to work. So this is what I've done. <laughs> um, Okay, this were a lot of Stratocaster questions. Um, any more Strat questions at this point?
Okay, next question, Marcel. Hi, Thomas. What is your opinion on cryo tuning? Cryo tuning. I know Oli Lohmann is a big fan out of it, but as you can have a real deal 61 strat, do you think a cryo tune strat can reach the real pre CS CBS tone? Wow. So there is a lot of information in this question. First, you have to understand what is cryo tuning. Um, there's a, a fellow, nice gentleman, his name is George Forrester from Munich or Bavaria. And he came up with the idea to freeze your guitar. So if you have a new guitar, mostly those new guitars, they sound a bit stiff. They have, um, they don't sound the same like a played guitar. So my first experience is if you have a new guitar played and you will notice that it will change and it will change dramatically at the beginning but it will still change after years. So that's one part why my 61 is so special because it's been played so much. Um, so people want that sound but they want it now without playing and um, there are several techniques to apply stress to wood and hardware, how to get whatever the tension out of the material and improve the free vibration, whatever. So fact is, um, if you put your guitar into the cryo um, process and freeze it, it sounds different afterwards. So. If your guitar is totally bright, it will change and it will sound mellower. Now comes the question, if you go into detail, some parts change and maybe it is the tone that you want, but maybe you already lose something. So I have played Cryo guitars that really have improved and I played some guitars that I thought maybe they have improved overall but they lost something and so okay maybe I'm a, nit <laughs> a very picky here um, nitpicker I would probably treat only the wood um, but I'm not the expert and I have not the experience of going on that detailed level so what I'm saying is, yes, you can tune and cryo your guitar and yes, it will sound smoother. Um, but I think as everything I learned with strats and details like saddles and treating them with heat, we've done that with a Bunsenbrenner, I don't know the English word for that, <laughs> with uh, the flames and heat it up to, to get the stress out of the metal, it does change. And um, I, I learned, my lesson that I learned is you have to be careful. You, um, the, you know, all the stuff and all the, the techniques you can apply, they do something, yes. Uh, if not, I wouldn't, I would tell you, but yes, they do something and they do something in, in a direction that can be nice but be careful how far you go. So, sorry, I'm, um, I'm, I'm positive, but I'm also a bit critical, like with everything in general. Okay, next question, Alexander. Mr. Blug, what your favorite pushing M pedals? What your favorite pushing M pedals? Ah, overdrive or boosted? What are you using now in your pedal board and on the record and what pedals um, didn't like? Okay, that's a very good question because now I want to come to the second part of this episode, <laughs> which be will become way too long. Um, I do have a few pedals here. Um, I have this is the original box of my Ivanis Tube Screamer TS808. You know, this box alone costs a fortune. And here is the magic pedal. Da -da 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 -da. <laughs> um, 
I paid not too much money for it because I bought it years ago. Let's hear it on the clean channel. So what it does is what it's famous famous for. It's it makes that kind of mid honk ah 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 ah, and then with the tone you can dial in how much of the high end you want to keep. Like open, or you can darken the whole thing to make the sound more like a humbucker. And this is why I love a tube screamer for doing that. It's like without. But I prefer that on the drive channel. When I go and have this. That's my um, tube screamer to make my single coil Les Paul, oh, uh, Strat, sorry, sound a little bit like my Les Paul. Um, that's the way I like the tube screamer. And um, yeah, as you could see, I didn't use much overdrive. The, the drive control was very, very low. I used it as a booster and a tone coloration and had the drive mostly coming from the amp itself. Um, on the clean channel... For my setup, it's a bit too honky. Um, if you use this in front of a traditional scooped Fender amp, you know, like a Princeton, it makes a lot of sense. And this is why a Super Reverb or Steve Ray Vaughan tone makes a lot of sense with this. I would use my clean channel on a different setting with the Tube Screamer. But hey, that's the Tube Screamer. I personally think it's a great pedal, but people make way too much noise about that pedal. It's, it's just one of those pedals and it's not worth the money people ask for. And if you have a decent clone, it's good. And this one, oh, yeah, it's very vintage. <laughs> um, now let's compare this thing to what this is called the super hard on. It's a booster. So I plug in the guitar where the guitar sign is and I plug in the output where the B is. <laughs> so Tube Screamer go away, bye bye. And now we have bypass. Ah. Um. So this is my already slightly boosted clean channel, how I play it on the M1, which is like guitar volume on 10 and it's ah, and it was already on. So. We went back to here. This is how the thing is on bypass, and this is my tone. Okay, a nice clean sound at the edge of breaking up. But now. I 
have a little boost and this boost doesn't have any overdrive. It's just a gain boost, just a level boost with the control called Crackle OK. So that's a, that's a great thing for a manufacturer. You know, you simply write Crackle OK and <laughs> you have no service to do because you bought the pedal with Crackle OK. You know, if we do Crackle on our amps, we have a service issue, <laughs> but here Crackle is OK. <laughs> channel boosted tons of dynamic I like it so if I would go and boost the clean channel with all the way up That's a bit noisy, but hey, that's a booster in front of my clean channel. Shows me two things. The breakup of the amp is killer because the saturation now comes from the amp. I just drive the input harder. This is just level. I can prove by turning down the clean volume. And Sounds really shitty. <laughs> So this is a nice way how to drive the input harder. Um, then I have another booster, which is maybe my favorite booster at this time. It's getting warm and it's called the fire bottle. It's using something like a nanotube in there. <laughs> it's not just blue guitar, it's a UK company called Effectrode. And bypass. Ah. Here's my clean sound. So this is my clean tone where I have this little edge of breakup. And now I bring in the fire bottle. Thank you. 
That was my clean channel. Yeah. Yeah, okay, with this thing on full. Um, a nice way. That's my booster. Uh, talking about boosters, let's see a quick comparison why we are here. Uh, get this thing out of the way and use something that we need for that Brian May issue. The good old Range Master. Greetings to my friends from JHS in the UK. And as they sold them in the 60s to all my heroes in the UK. Um, and I got an original old one. And this is what it sounds like. Clean, noisy. <laughs> This is the high gain from the 60s, Range Master. Okay, um, we have a closer look into this pedal when we have that magic red special guitar. Here is my version of the Range Master, I've done myself. Um, it has the honk, but I have a switch for it, so I can have that. <laughs> That's the original kind of low end and that's a bit more bass, how I like it. Okay, you, you can see there's many different versions of that kind of recipe. I mean, my friend Bernd Meiser, BSM, he builds any kind of range master or booster pedal. So he is the German booster expert, BSM pedals. Um, wow, we got lost here. Um, what was the question? Um, what, okay, what's my favorite pushing the amp, overdrive or boosters? Um, Put it that way, I'm the booster guy. On my pedal board, I have like three or four different boosters and I use the gain from the amp. That's my philosophy. Other people use different gain pedals and then use the amp more neutral, something that's absolutely fine as well. So um, we have our fellow from the Netherlands, um, Eric de Jong, and he showed us the zero gain mode where he kind of get all the gain out of the channels and used his pedals that he likes to make the gain. And um, I'm still the fan of the internal gain of the M1. That's my style. That's why I designed it that way. But if there's so many ways um, and therefore boosters give me the spice and um, I use boosters to um, fine-tune the channels towards I want them. Maybe with a Tube Screamer, maybe with one of those little boosters here, but you can see the magic of boosters. Okay, um, <laughs> then again, are we hearing the blue box uh, in the mixer? Yes. And the, uh, or Mike, no, we, we're listening to the Blue box direct. Uh, the master is on six, and you'd be deaf by now. <laughs> no, no, he has no cap. So um, the thing is, we do have 
the blue box connected and um, we have no cap in the room. I'm just having a, a, a little studio monitor here for the situation so that I can hear myself. Um, yeah, that's, that's just the setup. If I would play, this is my stage volume, as you know, Ben. <laughs> uh, I'm on six and I like the headroom and be too loud. Um, I always tell people I'm on five, that's true, but sometimes I'm on six. That's the magic spot. Sorry for that one. Um, yeah, I had another thing from our last episode, which was the Big Muff. Yeah. Um, Big Muff. That's the real Russian one. Um, how do they like that, that sound? Well, I show you. Would I play them in front of the clean channel or of a saturation channel? It depends on how goofy the sound should be. Okay. Clean. Oh man, shut up, <laughs> the noise. Um, the thing about muffs is um, you can have them sound like a mosquito if you have a bright clean channel. Let me show you, I go and back, roll back the volume. So the sound is the muff, and this now is kind of the drive from the amp one, and I would kind of have a little bit of both for my taste. So. For me, a big muff, it's a sound from the past and it's great because it makes you think like, hey, we are going back to the 70s, you know, have our long hair back and, <laughs> you know, this funky kind of uh, atmosphere with all, you know, Afro style looks. They, they used to be, uh, play fuzzes. I do have another fuzz here just to show you how crazy the world is with fuzzes. Um, yeah, that's a big, big muff um, deluxe from Electro Harmonix, almost as big as the M1. And where the input is here, and there's a combination of a compressor and a fuzz. Well, that's the deluxe version. Let's hear it. Okay. And there's a compressor only version uh, output and I can have them parallel or serial. Okay, I move the stuff in the middle. Come on, baby. Yeah. So. That's a lot of noise, 
but it's also a lot of compression. So yeah, that thing gives you uh, the effect of a compressor and a, a, a fuzz, a big muff in one box. And I can have the signal. <laughs> Compressor only. And blend it with a fuzz to maintain a little bit attack. Yeah, or use it in front of my vintage channel. Okay, fuzz, uh, big muff. To me, it's a special effect, um, and this is why I'm a bit goofy about it. I would use it for sounds that uh, sound like my amp would be burning or stuff like that. Okie doke. Um, what's the next question? Are we hearing the blue box? Uh, like, okay, okay, this was the last question. Any more questions? Um, Stucky, Roger Stucky, is it possible to get good sounds from the M1 with headphones? Sure, yes, uh, for practice. We do have a recording out which has a, uh, a symbol with the headphones. So you can plug in your headphones directly into M1 and it uses the internal speaker simulation, which is um, pretty good. Um, our friend here, um, um, Ben Grenfeld, uses M1 and he uses also the blue box. And he used the blue box in the studio and he uses the blue box live. And then he, he wrote me an email and said, you know what? I use the direct out from the M1 and I'm not sure if I like that better or the blue box. So it's a good sound. And that's a good sound too. On the blue box, you have more options. You have 16 different cabinets that you can choose from. On the M1, there's just one simple one. Use some reverb with it uh, because it's super direct if you have headphones. So some reverb does help to enjoy playing through headphones. Yeah. Well, any more questions? If not, Please save them for the next week. And um, let uh, one, one more question. It's all good. Okay, I get science. That's all good. So next week, um, if you do have any questions, write us uh, under the post, um, under the live stream, so we can prepare and think about stuff that you might be interested in. I hope the insights into Stratocasters were not too deep. Um, I will talk about other guitars in the future as well, Les Paul, and um, there's more guitars than strat strats, but I, you know, I'm a strat guy, I, I know my strat and I know my tone. Ah, last thing I was forgetting about, I have to show you. There's a, a beautiful 64 strat um, behind me. And I wanted to show you that as, as well. Get rid of that funky box. This is this is a blue guitar, which is a great guitar, I believe. 
with my recipe. And now I can go and play that real deal 1964 with the bigger logo, which means it's second half of 64. Totally original Stratocaster with original three-way switch and original pickups. The only thing that I changed was the frets because they were too worn out and Also nice guitar, but After all these years, I have a guitar which is new and sounds old. And that makes me happy. Anyway, see you next week, same time, same place. Take it care of yourself and make the best of your time. Maybe practice. I should that, do that too. All the best. Cheers.